Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first episode of this year's YDA Week Interviews, where we'll be speaking to a series of directors and learning about their careers and their thoughts on filmmaking through the answer to six questions. First up is Irish director Lenny Abrahamson. Lenny studied philosophy and physics at Trinity College in Dublin before segueing into filmmaking. His first short film, Three Joes, won a cabinet full of awards, and after directing commercials for brands such as Carlsberg, he moved into features in 2004 with his award-winning debut, Adam and Paul. From there, he's, a direct, he's directed films including Garage, What Richard Did, Frank, and the Oscar-nominated Room. He's also been hugely successful as a television director with the smash hit series Normal People and the upcoming Conversation with Friends, both adapted from novels by Sally Rooney. Over the next 40 minutes, Lenny discusses the films which inspired him to become a director, the biggest filmmaking challenges he's faced, and the piece of advice all aspiring de directors should bear in mind. Lenny Abrahamson, thank you so much for joining us for the YDA Talk. It's a real pleasure to, to have you here with us today. Pleasure to be here. Thanks, Danny. Good. So the first question that we've got for you is, what's the film that most inspired you to want to be a director? Oddly enough, it's a film that I, I, I haven't sort of stayed in love with, but I remember um, being about, I don't know, 10 or 12, when kind of really inappropriately I was taken to see Kubrick's 2001 in the cinema in Dublin. I guess you could work out what age I was if I just checked the release date. But anyway, um, it was way over my head. But I just remember the sense of kind of um, like how how I'd never seen anything that kind of made me feel both uncomfortable and intrigued and out of my depth before. And there were just some sequences in it, not actually the kind of, you know, obelisky stuff, uh, but actually just those those initial scenes on the... Uh, on the spaceship, that quietness and that sense of kind of something else happening underneath. And, and that just stayed in my head for years as a kind of, you know, watching kids movies and all the other stuff that you'd watch as a, as a young, young person, this idea of this kind of more mysterious dimension that cinema could have or this deeper feeling or whatever, that really stayed with me. And I think it kind of niggled away at me. Um, and I'm going to pick another one as well, if that's okay, it breaks oh, the rule. Shit. But later on, um, I was, and, and neither of these films relate to this style that I work in at all, but I remember BBC used to broadcast, like BBC Two, late at night, they'd just fill the schedule with European art house movies, yeah. you know, yeah. or, or there was also uh, Movie Dome and all that amazing stuff, uh, and a whole bunch of weird American cinema and, and interesting European kind of curiosities affect me. But I do remember seeing Bergman's movie, The Silence, which is just about these two women on a, in a, in a European city. And it just, I was old enough then to sort of realize how kind of special this was without again, fully understanding the movie. I don't know if I fully understand it now, but <laughs> it also made me think about the potential like glories that cinema could kind of, um, encapsulate, you know. Yeah, yeah. And but so talking of the two thousand and one uh, film, had you up to that point considered being a director? Like, is that something that had crossed your mind? And was two thousand and one something that kind of pushed you towards? Well, actually, this is something I want to do too. I think it was it was later that I actually thought, oh, there is this job, you know, there is this thing that you can do where yeah. you really run this movie making lark you know where you or you can get your ideas onto the screen yeah but i think the the feeling of like oh my god what would it be like to participate in that was there from from then yeah but it was probably like the late teens when i was watching those movies on bbc like nine, 18 19 when i thought that is a a, a a role like doing that would be incredible yeah um but it did feel like it's really interesting to think about like what what does a decision really look like because you might have there's there's a moment when you sort of make the thing you make the decision for real and that's the moment when you really start doing things before that there's like at least the way i work there's all this kind of like half a step forward uncertainty uh you know and around the time i'm talking about while i loved the idea of being a film director i think i felt it was sort of a bit like saying that you know being 12 and saying that you want to be an astronaut you know right it's like a sort Outreach. of 
Uh, yeah, out of reach, totally. Because back then in, in Ireland, particularly, the film industry was just minuscule, you know. And, and so when you looked into it, you just thought, well, I don't know, between me and this, this life, there seems to be a massive chasm. And I feel like that maybe isn't so much of an issue for people anymore because like, I don't know, the, there are more examples certainly here. And I think in the UK as well, it's more open and there are roots in and great film schools and all that sort of stuff. But then, so I think the decision to actually do it came later, like to really give it a crack was I made a short film just when I was leaving college I studied something else studied philosophy yeah. but I was still like had this burning feeling that I kind of understood this is I think what it is that I kind of you know I kind of understood what would be involved or had a feeling for what made something on screen uh, work the way it did because I, I think like the the doing of something like before the doing of it there's the kind of phantom doing of it you yeah. know what I mean like you sort of imagine I felt I could kind of deconstruct this like it made sense to me to tell a story in this way and I found myself in my early 20s thinking about situations that I was in filmically like thinking about how I would capture them or what it would be that that a, that a camera would allow you to kind of extract you know so I, yes. I think I was yeah. kind of oddly like running through the process in my head but it was I continued on with my studies in philosophy and I went to Stanford in uh, the states to work to do a PhD and while I was there I think I just I really remember sitting where I was living and one night and just going am I really going to continue with this or is there something else that I feel yeah. like I just want to do and that was when I said you know what I'm going to chuck this in yeah yeah and that was I suppose in a way that's the time that's the decision that counted because that's the time I actually did something about it but there were all there was all this like you know yeah. like half motions towards it I'd made a short I'd been messing around with cameras I'd done all that you know myself and Ed Guiney who I still work yeah really closely with Ed Guiney Element Pictures so behind you know the favorite and um like Sebastian Lelio films and yeah. just amazing producers um Ed and I were both in college together and, and he was, he had the same feeling about producing that I had about directing. Really? Okay. That's interesting. And so he set up with me and others, this filmmaking society. And I was just the director. Like I just said, right. I'll be the director, you yeah. know, like, 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 a, like, uh, yeah, I'll be the copy, you'll be the robber in right. this kind of, fantasy, <laughs> yeah. you know, but, but it so there's obviously well. something in me that really felt like that was the thing, but I yeah. really, I feel like the decision, you can only know you've made a decision when you actually sort of start acting on yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting as well, to me at least, that the, the films that you watched at a young age and that had an impact on you are quite philosophical. You know, they, they, yeah. they have that sort of element to them. Certainly both of those films that you mentioned, The Silence and 2001, and then you went on to study philosophy. Yeah. Do you think, well, do I always you think had, that's... I, I do think that's, there is that for sure. And... But, but I think what I discovered as I went on was that there's like a strong emotional dimension to what, in, what motivates me as well. And that's right. probably come out more than, than the other, um, ultimately. Like, you know, I was thinking as well, other, another film that I think had a big influence on me was um, a ridiculously sort of absurd but wonderful film called Leningrad Cowboys Go America. I don't know if you know the movie. I, I don't know. It, like, I highly recommend it. It's okay. absolutely, it's by Aki Kurismaki, who's this, the greatest Finnish director of all okay. time. Um, and it's a kind of oddly, it's a slow Scandinavian slapstick. And that definitely, there's something in what I do, like in Frank or Adam and Paul yeah. or in other films where there is actually a sort of, a kind of a, a, a poetic slapstick yeah. quality, yeah. which I, that's a territory. I think when I saw Leningrad Cowboys, I thought, oh, wow, I totally, that, I can see that. I know yeah. the, the impulse that's behind that movie. Um, and that really had an effect on me as well. But, it's, it's, and that's not philosophical at all, really. No. Um, but yes, you're right. The movies that really, really, really live with me have this kind of, um, as a viewer, have that kind of dimension to them. Okay, fantastic. And so moving on to commercials, obviously you uh, certainly at the start of your career were, you know, directed a lot of commercials and 
is there one commercial that you particularly admire either from that time or before you started or even you know after the fact and something you look back on and think that was a, a great piece of work uh, by me or by somebody else uh, by, well, well either i mean by somebody but, else i guess so let me do to somebody else much more fun um mm. so there were a bunch of commercials made probably in the mid 90s for volkswagen mm -hmm. that were really 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 low-key so you know they were there was no music yeah yeah it was just this kind of oblique like tiny slice of life but with just that little dimension of enough height to just leave you with a feeling of something beautiful and clever having been done yeah and and i think and there was there was a beautiful skoda commercial i remember where uh, a guy um is with a clipboard i think walking through a car show that's been set up and somebody's lowering a Skoda onto uh, a platform and the guy's going, well, look, you know, no, no, no. Yeah, it's yeah, clearly yeah. not that car that goes there. You know, it's too good looking. Yeah. And it was just, it was just that thing where the audience made the final connection. It's shot like a little movie. The casting is just ever so slightly heightened, but very naturalistic. Yeah. And, and I realized that um, I remember seeing those commercials and thinking I can do that. I don't know if I can do the, the full glossy thing, but I know tone. Yeah. I understand how you can make something feel like almost real, but still kind of delicious. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I then went on and I made the commercials that I probably like the most of the ones that I made. I made these little commercials. I made these nice commercials for Carlsberg, or, you know, probably commercials. Yes, which, I've seen which, a few of those. The one uh, with the guy in the flat and uh, the football. Exactly. It's just brilliant, yeah. Um, and that was in the days when they were like, there was real budget sort of, I know there are still sometimes, but I know it's hard yeah. now. Yeah. Um, but there, generally the budgets were higher, but I made these commercials for the Irish times right. where like there's one commercial, which you think could be sort of absolutely nothing, but it was just a, um, a kid. It's just a, um, a mum, uh, you know, cleaning the kitchen while she's still got the Irish Times weekend magazine in her hand on a Monday. Right. And she um, clean, she's cleaning the kitchen with a sandwich. It's like a squid, <laughs> squished up sandwich. She's rubbing things and just leaving tiny bits of crumbs, right? It's super low key, no music or whatever. And at the end, it just cuts to this kid in the playground opening their lunchbox and taking out a kitchen sponge. And yeah, yeah. Like it's nothing. But it was really, it sort of was really popular because it kind of, it had that same yeah. low key, Recognition almost real of, term. Uh, yeah. 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 And do you think, so uh, were those commercials before you started directing or while you were directing? Yes. They, they, they when, I think, I think while I was directing, when I had just started directing, they were around and they sort of, I remember thinking, yeah, that's, that's, that's really good. I mean, commercials, it's so interesting because every, it's a circle, like everybody's feeding on everybody else. Yeah, like yeah. something you, I remember, you know, we used to joke about it. There was a time early doors for me, like where I don't know if I'd even started really making them where every commercial had like swing and tilt lenses, you know, right. like yeah. half of the frame was slightly soft and you just go. And what happens is somebody does it for the first time, usually on a very high end yeah. commercial. And then that just like you can see it's like watering a plant. It's like it all the, down, yeah. It filters down. And then then the Tesco eventually it's like a, you know, a little commercial that yeah. <laughs> yeah. has the swing and tilt lenses or whatever. Yeah. Um I'm trying to think when I was a kid, I loved commercials as well. I remember, you know, because that was and that's a different experience, I think, as well. I don't know how that plays now for people watching in the way that we watch. You know, but then you just waited. You just watched the commercials. Yeah. It was part of the yeah. kind of evening. Yeah. And I do. I remember some of the Alan Parker commercials that you know those classic ones, which yeah. were really great. And um, yeah, so so there were definitely those influential ones for me. Do you, is there a different approach? Do you think in directing commercials and movies and I mean, do you approach projects in the similar way, regardless of what the kind of format or length of those projects are? I mean, yes and no. So I was interesting. I was talking a lot about this at the moment because having done quite a lot of television mm -hmm. um, or, or like how that how that distinction between movies and television has really changed, you know? Yeah. You know, it used to be you're either a film director or a TV director and there was a bit of snobbery around that. Yeah. And similarly around commercials. Um, and now directors move very fluidly between certainly film and television. And there are differences, definitely 
but they're not kind of the ones that I would have thought back in the day, I would have said, and th this is, this is interesting, I think from a commercials point of view as well, but back in the day, I would have said, look, when you get somebody into a movie theater, they've paid for a ticket and they've gone and they've sat, they're sitting there. Right. So you sort of have this attentional capital, like, you know, that they're going to give it quite a bit before yeah. they go, wait a second, I'm not sure about this. So you can kind of, you can like teach an audience your style over yeah. the first few minutes and know that they're going to like, okay, let's, let's see what this is. You can they're be quite slow. You, um, and I would have said before, you can't do that on TV, you know, because everybody's poised with the remote control in their yeah. hand and they're going to, but actually what's really remarkable now is it's harder and harder to get anything thoughtful into the cinemas because right. there is such a kind of, you know, there is a huge amount of like big, um, movie yeah. sort of stuff coming all the time and audiences are not giving other styles really a chance in the cinema or neither are exhibitors you know right and um, if it doesn't make money in the first weekend just forget about it yeah but on television people are on the streamers they are so like with something like normal people which is actually quite low-key yeah and slow in the first episodes by the standards of everything around it, you might have thought, well, that's, you know, forget it. People would mm. just go, well, I've got 15 other things on my Netflix that yeah. I'd like to watch, but it didn't work that way. And I think it, there's a lesson there with commercials as well, because I, I do think in a very noisy environment, media wise, <clears throat> there is an amazing power to sort of low key things and clever and people like, if you can do it right, something quite kind of thoughtful or slower or observational or whatever really does really does stand out um but just just to but to answer your question yes I, there are differences like so just structurally when you're making uh say a movie is much more like a kind of short story in the sense that there's a kind of you work towards a real rise in intensity you yeah. know like a single movement towards yep. this kind of moment or or kind of recognition or realization in the story with television it's much more novelistic and you can have you can be quite you know you can take a little detour into something you can you can be kind of the story can pulse rather than kind yeah. of go in a single yeah. and and commercials i think are just a kind of i think commercials oddly enough are more like movies in that what you're looking for is this kind of single impact like yeah. this you know and and that's na the nature of it also is because you are actually commercials serve a purpose outside of themselves yes which is that you are trying to say something about a product or a service yeah. or a brand um there is this kind of like what people respond to in commercials is a is a kind of efficiency and precision Oddly enough, they price in the idea of selling. Yes. Like it's not something you have to hide. Yeah. You know what I mean? You, like, you, well, you know what you're getting from it, don't you? I mean, you, yeah. you know why you're watching it. It's a you know why you're watching it. And, and then if somebody does that well, you go, okay, that's yeah. a, 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 you know, and that reflects well on the brand as yeah. well. Like, like does the, the, does the brand um, insult your intelligence or does it, yeah. does it kind of, does it like give you something good? Yeah, um, yeah as a pleasure i think when I, I remember watching commercials early on and thinking it's quite interesting that it's no longer about like the product is a good product you know watching like those early levi's commercials yes you, know, you go aha uh -huh. it's it's about oh we we are bringing you it's a bit like the old-fashioned you know this soap powder is sponsoring this show yeah like we are bringing you a a piece of really pleasurable kind of but, yeah i mean i suppose the difference is that's you know they're brand building versus product selling but you know, product, that's kind exactly. of what, yeah levi's and those sort of brands are, are, are building their brand as much yeah, as they are completely. selling their product so, uh, so but it's interesting what you said as well about so you know like the success of normal people um which was was so huge but it kind of goes back to the the commercial you mentioned before, the one uh, for the Irish Times, where yeah. it is kind of it's a slice of life, right? I mean, I guess people yeah. and you gravitated towards the Irish Times one because it felt like it was something that you may happen to yeah. you or to your mum or something. And, and normal exactly, people, normal. People. And, and actually, because I'm interested in that style of working, I'm interested in how you can. 
I was always interested in how, how like how you can do stuff which appears to be nothing, yeah, but is really impactful. Yeah, yeah. So, so like, uh, I think there's two ways of 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 behaving as a filmmaker. Like, there's obviously a million ways of behaving, but there's one interesting distinction, which is: Are you showing off your skill or are you hiding it? Yeah, yeah. And so, the stuff that I tend to gravitate towards is stuff where you go uh, it, it looks like i'm just watching people like saying sort of normal stuff to each other and mm. you know sitting in chairs and getting yeah. on buses and stuff and yet something about the rhythm or the focus or the the writing just m- makes it un- undeniable you just have to keep watching yeah. it and i've always yeah. been really interested in that what like and how little that yeah. and, and i i think I've, I've got a kind of um like puritanical streak in me or something like that. Like <laughs> I don't like to see loads of shit thrown at the screen. Yeah. I feel like that's not a, there's a deep inefficiency and it's sort of yeah. like, like, no, how, how like precise and tiny can this be yeah. and still do what you need it to do? But it's the characters, right? I mean, certainly the normal people and, and a lot of your work, the, the characters are the, are the key. That's yeah. what's being thrown at the screen. It's who they are and how it's who they are. Exactly. And, and having faith in an audience that, yeah, that, that that will be compelling yes yes absolutely okay so let's move on to the third thing so the person in the industry that you you most look up to and, and why that is oh my god it's such a <laughs> tricky one Hard um, to one you mean the that. whole industry across the board yeah i just i suppose uh, the person that over the course of your career or even before your career that you look to and thought you know that's a person that i really admire and i even want to follow or take their advice whether you personally know them i suppose or or someone that you yeah. kind of admire from afar i mean i think um like probably there's there are a couple of different people like there's a there's an exec actually that like that I really love working with. There are two execs, I'm going to say, if that's okay. Yeah. And then I'm going to give you some filmmaker people as well. Sure. I know it's supposed to be one person, but I couldn't narrow it down. We can stretch, we can stretch the... Oh, uh, the there are no rules, Danny. <laughs> um, so I, I really admire Tessa Ross, who used to run Film 4 yeah. and was really instrumental in shifting me from um, very small... F- up up to a big slightly bigger film basically she, she was responsible for uh frank in a way her mm-hmm. and my agent rachel holroyd who said when i read it first i'd never done anything that came from outside the family if you know what i mean yep. this is a script that came to me and i was very, very much in the world of going i'm just gonna you know i think i should just keep making uh kind of uncompromisingly art house and small films yeah but i knew there was something else that i did want to like play with a bigger canvas and um and tessa really just made me think about that and uh and and really pushed it with the producers and with me and also just her advice was always amazing and i just felt she was one of these people who provided a space in the industry for um the creative people to lead the projects yeah. you know okay and 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 that uh, film four at that period was like central to the british film industry yeah. and and the irish film industry actually through people like me and i think she's amazing and then rose garnett who's also out of film four has now just left the bbc uh to go to a24 right um is another superb exec who's been at the center of a lot of the things that i've done and she's another wise and brilliant person and i think it's important actually because there are terrible executives out there and most filmmakers spend their time going oh the bloody execs or the suits or whatever yeah but actually when you work with really good ones it's like aha now i get it now i get why that's a role that's important so then outside of 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 those two who i really admire i probably now and it's not somebody that was around when i started but I really admire um, Paul Thomas Anderson. Like, mm-hmm. I just think he's a, he, he has a career which is just entirely his. Um, he, he's managed to do, you know, superb work within the structure that exists now and get it to substantial audiences. I yeah. think that's a, you know, and I think that's a really, really hard thing to do now, to be yeah. an auteur, but to be an auteur of, you know, on a certain scale. And I think as a filmmaker, um, he's 
just there's a uh, a sort of there's a mastery of the medium yeah that is really extraordinary so yeah i admire him greatly um i'm going to give you one more as well because i just because i can <laughs> um that's fine um like uh lynn ramsey i admire hugely yeah, okay. like i felt you were never really there i would have been like I think I would have been happy to retire after right. making that. Really? It's okay. just brilliant and uh, cr like criminally overlooked in the British film industry, like by BAFTA and stuff like that. I don't get it. But anyway, yeah, she's another yeah. person yeah. I admire for it's doing her own thing relentlessly. It's interesting you say about the execs and the, and the kind of way people kind of treat them. But from what you said, um, certainly about Tessa is, is that element of trust it seems like they, they put their trust in the creative process and also in the creative people that are kind of executing that process I guess that must be key to, to, to sort of having that trust and, and admiring them uh, completely that. and actually the, the, the really interesting thing about it is the really really good um, execs and producers and, and studio people will never try and answer their question. They'll usually just say that the notes are often really, sometimes there'll be a really like an insight that kind of opens things up, but often it's just, I think you can make that better. Yeah, right. You know, and and that's just, you know, and that's that, and, and from the right person, that's sort of all you need. I mean, I was thinking about this and I, when I'm talking to people who work in exclusively in advertising, filmmakers, um, I always say that the thing that shocked me most in moving into making films on television, um, at least in the way that I've been lucky enough to make stuff with really good people. I, but, but the thing that amazed me most is that like over the course of, say, this series that I've just done, Conversations with Friends, right? Yeah. Which, you know, or Room, a Take Room is, yeah. is a purer example. Um, I probably had... In the whole phase of script, uh, you know, shooting and post, maybe five percent of the of the kind of note giving and conversation and scrutiny that I would have on a sixty second commercial. Really? Yeah. Like, I mean, maybe five percent isn't fair over the course of like a year and a half. It might mount up a bit. Yeah. But but much much less. Really? Yeah, and that's and and actually. Like, in other words, what will happen is, you know, you'll, you'll draft to the script, will come in, you'll talk, you'll share them. So a few notes will come back, but they're very general. Yeah. Nothing through the shoot. Is that because, Nothing I mean, whatsoever. I suppose, you know, you take away the clock, you know, there's no, you're not selling anything, you know, like yes. I said, it's in, in and of itself, it is what it is, whereas there's, That's no, true. there's no layers That's true. of, of But if you think about it, there is such a, there is like, you know, an awful lot of money involved. Yes. And, where you can imagine people going oh my god if it's not more exciting in this section people will tune out right. i think people are just more the, the 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 kind of culture is more about trusting the creative people and not micromanaging i think the thing that i right. found hardest on commercials when i was really doing them a lot was just the level of micromanagement mm. you know every like you know every single like if this was the shot if your if your shot was the shot that'd be a five hour discussion on the ordering of books and the shelf behind you yeah. Do you know what i mean yeah everyone's got and an that opinion. gets so tiring everyone's got an opinion yeah <laughs> okay so look moving on so what, what project uh, that you've worked on has been in the biggest challenge uh, over the course of your career so far that's really easy okay. frank absolutely was the biggest challenge really how so um so combination of not having quite enough money right um it being the first time I'd worked with kind of, you know, well-known big name actors, yeah. but a short schedule, like six week schedule or something, including two countries, terrible. Oh my really? God. Is that all it was? Yeah. And, but the most challenging thing was like doing the music live. Right. So we had this idea, like Stephen Rennix, who I work with really closely, yeah. composer, wrote all the songs as well as the soundtrack. And I, I did a little bit of, um, song work as well because we I, I sort of have a vaguely musical background too okay. and um mostly lyrics and stuff mm -hmm. uh and it was great fun especially in the early phases where we were in studio with other musicians that we knew and messing and finding a, a voice for that odd band that was both yeah. 
But trying to solve that problem, how do you have a band which is its USP, its function in the story is to be shit, sort of, <laughs> right? <laughs> but not quite, actually. You sort of go, oh my God, it's next door to being genius. And if they could just go a yeah. little bit more. So you have to, that's a hard, hard spot to find. Yeah. Think about all the band movies, you know. Yeah. It's really hard. So you have to write a whole album's worth of stuff for that band. And then we were determined, because when you see movies on on uh on bands you know and everybody's miming it just looks so fake you yes. just don't believe it yes. so we wanted to cast actors who could play and then write the music around how well they could play and what instruments okay so while you're hurtling towards production and your cast is changing and you're going oh fuck we don't have a you know nobody can play the sax anymore you yeah. know, shit. <laughs> scrap yeah. those um and then getting the actors over trying to work out how good they are and then on the day it's tough enough to make a movie but we're basically making a movie and a kind of live album at the same time yeah. so he's like but only one sound department yeah. running normal location sound and a big a, a you know 24 track setup and wow. it was just and then and then managing the you know under that kind of pressure um managing the kind of um chaos of a shoot and i just i remember being in we shot in albuquerque in new mexico we created a feeling of south by southwest and um i just remember filming the last scene where they play in this dive bar and yeah. john walks away and frank and the band are back together again and in the as the time went on that day and as we were getting more and more squeezed i remember thinking to myself I'm, I, I think I might be about to have a heart attack. Like I thought to myself, really? this is, I just can't, <clears throat> this is too much. And like, there was definitely like, there was, everybody was quite tense. There was lots mm. of, but we got it. But I do feel like it took years off my life. And the, the sometimes, I mean, I love it and I love doing it, but I sometimes think to myself, if I ever feel a bit stressed, I sort of go through this thought experiment and I put myself back in the middle of making Frank right. and go, oh, I'm not making Frank. <laughs> it's not, and that makes me feel a whole lot better. <laughs> but do you feel like so do you look back on that and feel like that talk you know it was a, a, as challenging as it was it was quite an experience it taught you a lot about um, how to do things or not to do things and yes. what to take on and what not to take on no it taught me hugely because like i think getting through that and i often talk with Stephen about it because we were both in the trenches together with it um i think it was a really sort of like it, it's like a stealing experience you know mm -hmm. like you go through that sort of fire and that pressure and the fear that your entire kind of career is going to come tumbling down because it's the first kind of bigger thing you've done and yeah, maybe yeah. you don't have enough money to do it and yeah you know and then dealing with actors who are like the difference it's really interesting you know the difference and it depends on the actor right but one thing you learn with more established actors is they're usually extremely experienced yeah. like so if something on set isn't working like in the crew for example yeah normally nobody notices that it's like you're the mechanic and unless you know so you know you can ever you can present the face to cast that keeps them super happy and calm they don't quite know what goes on amongst all these people really experienced actors will look at you and go yeah right problem over there isn't there yeah. is that going to delay us and you're going oh fuck you know and and when you're when it's you know when you're so relatively young and it's your first time you're going oh please god don't you know <laughs> and, and the other the other thing I think is just you know when you're dealing with people who have really strong creative opinions and they're yeah. not always great sometimes they're brilliant sometimes yeah. they're not and when they're not you have to say no and yeah. and that's just I think I learned like I grew up and I grew up making Frank and so much of my kind of approach to to being on the floor and and working with cast and the politics of 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 how you handle this kind of machine i kind of learned in doing and i wouldn't i wouldn't change it i love the movie yeah. it's just that it was it was just such a hard thing to do yeah it was very well received i mean i know it was brilliantly critically received and it did really well so yeah i mean i guess out of that challenging and sort of tumultuous time something really good came out of it uh, absolutely you know and 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 i kind of and i feel like it was worth it i think the worst thing would be to have a really hard shoot yeah and then go oh you know but but no and then there were really happy and pleasurable moments it's just that 
I feel like the the level of budget and time, given the things we were trying to achieve, yeah. made it like just a sort of a salt course. Yeah, you know? yeah. So we talked of the the most challenging uh, project you've worked on. What's the project that you're most? Pr- I mean, it could be the same. I don't know. But what's the project you're you're most proud of uh, having achieved? I mean, it's a really difficult one. It's like choosing between your kids or something. Yeah. Um, but probably. I think I'm really proud of, I'm proud of all of them, but I'll talk about one that sort of stands out because it's the first one. I, I'm really proud of Adam and Paul mm-hmm. because it was, because it was the kind of, in a way it was such a pure process because n- none of us had any reputation to worry about, yeah. you know, like it was my first film, it was Marco Halloran's first film. All of the actors were kind of new to cinema um we made it for very little money on the streets which meant that actually in a sense we had the level of freedom that you would need a much bigger budget yeah to have yes. you know because you just don't give a shit you just go and shoot yeah. and you know uh whereas on a bigger budget like in a bigger a slightly bigger budget you'd have i don't know would have been oddly harder yeah um and and, and it was really freewheeling like it was the clo- just that sense of joy in shooting something that we knew was odd and different and funny and sad and um and and to go through that process and really come out with something that we felt really proud of i think that w- that that's what makes that one special because it was yeah. the first time and because it was no nobody was looking at us there was no expectation yeah. can you can you can you ever regain that i mean i suppose because you had no reputation like you say and you hadn't you had nothing to lose essentially so yeah. you you just did what you needed to do and what you wanted to do C- can you ever replicate that is that i don't think you can lifetime? i think there are other pleasures like that that um you know and everything everything i've done has had its own like personality and even the experience itself has been different you know um so so that probably not because there is something about that like I can imagine and for me it was one movie I I can imagine making you know making a bunch of movies early on that nobody was looking at but I was lucky enough after Adam and Paul that it did well you know and it did become a thing um I also the second movie Garage you know oddly enough we had exactly what we needed money wise and time wise which has almost never happened to me before or since and that was very special you know because it was a very pure story I think I'm also, I'm also extremely, I mean, I'm proud of all of them. I feel like Room is very close to being like fully realized okay. as in as close to what I had in my head as, as, as I've got. Um, but, but probably the, I mean, the other one that stands out as joyful, like, so, so, so not so much, which do I think is the best, but which, where was the joy along with Adam and Paul, I would say normal people actually, because, okay. um, because it was a young cast yeah and and there's something really energizing about that for an older person you know just being around that energy i think here's the reason because paul daisy and all the gang in normal people were having the experience on normal people that i had on adam and paul in other words right they were fresh out of drama school and you know, and they were going, oh my God, we've been cast in this thing, which has some scale and we're, and people are treating us really well and, and yeah. the material is good. And, and it was just like, I fed off that energy. I could yeah. see in them that same feeling that I'd had 20 yeah. years before when I'd made my first feature. Yeah. Um, and I loved working with them. They were so kind of, and, and it's, it, there's, there's also a young cast in, in conversations with friends, but it's just COVID kind of changed a little bit, the dynamic of, of that but normal people was just it I I have a memory of it being really sunny and really happy and everybody sort of full of the pleasure of working Mm. together with these younger people who were just having an absolute ball you know and and was that their first kind of proper project then for for all of those guys because you know watching it it's, it's quite, and I'm, I'm not an actor and I don't profess yeah. to know too much about it, but often the, you know, there's a lot of silence in normal yeah. people. There's a lot of yeah. kind of just them and their expressions yeah. and kind of what's going on in their head. And that feels like that's quite a, an intense thing to do and quite a difficult thing to do. Yes. And obviously as brand new actors, it feels like that's that's quite a big ask, but they obviously yes, called it off brilliantly. it's true. I hadn't really thought about it like that, but you're right. I mean, Paul Meskel, absolutely first thing he'd done. Right. One commercial, I think. 
He told really me right. that. Um, Daisy had been in uh, Cold Feet, the right. reboot, and yeah. she had done other things. She had a bit more experience, but nothing like leading a show like mm. this. Um, but I think in a way, I hope all of us at the on the other side of the camera created an environment where they didn't feel like they felt kind of looked after and 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 cared for yeah. and in a way protected from the sense that they're carrying the whole thing on their shoulder yeah yeah and it's i'm quite pretty intimate. relaxed it's in, an intimate show as well you know absolutely so it's quite so uh, they had to go like you had intimate scenes you yeah. had as you say very quiet scenes where so much pressure is on just the actor yeah you know there's nothing to hide behind no. there's no there's no big plot point no there's no you know it's just them together subtle stuff happening but i think they relished it because they're just they are great actors i think it yeah. would have been terrifying if they hadn't been for them yes and yes. for us yeah. but you know that's the joy of casting well and yeah amazing casting director louise kylie and karen scully and people who we just found actors that were like, oh, these are great actors. It's just nobody has, nobody's used them yet. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Um, and paid I think off. they have the challenge. Yeah, it paid off for sure. It's, it was a, such a huge hit, such a great show. So uh, it was crazy. Yeah. 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 Brilliant. So look, Lenny, I, we've kept you long enough. So a final question uh, sure. for you today. What's the one piece of filmmaking advice that, that you'd want to pass on to, to kind of a, an up and coming director? So my my piece of advice is I think there's a fundamental thing that needs to happen when you're on set and it's a, it's a skill and a habit and it's worth kind of getting into. And I, I'll describe it like this. When you, when you're prepping something, you know, working on a, whatever it is, commercial short or film or whatever, you put in all this effort to construct, to build things. You know, you're talking to the designer, you're, to, you're casting, you're talking to the DP, you're thinking about how you want to shoot and what sort of style of camera movement or no camera movement, all of this, right? And you're pick, you know, you're choosing locations and you're and you're drawing and you're doing all that, right? Yeah. And the de- the thing that can happen on set is that all of that construction is in your head. And then when you call action and you're watching it, there's a real danger that all you do then is kind of tick off the predetermined things you need. Right. Yeah, this is how it should look. Yeah, I have it in the storyboard. She right. walks from here to here. Then that's right. Yeah, cut. I'm happy with that, right? Yeah. And actually, for me, the trick is once I'm on the floor and I'm watching it, and actually from rehearsal, you know, I try to deprofessionalize myself. Okay. Because I think that the real job at that point shifts from the building and the constructing to sort of watching and feeling whether it means at all the thing you think it means. Right. In other words, and whether the, whether you believe it. Yeah. So I mean, moving this, away from the mechanical, basically. To moving away from the mechanical and the, and the sort of the film directory expertness. Yeah. Because what's really interesting is if you see something that doesn't work and you see it on TV, say everybody from the t- tinker the tailor the, the candlestick maker yeah can tell yeah discuss kind of a bit fake or yeah it's a bit weird what why, why would they do that right everybody can feel it but the director may well have been sitting on set and so caught up in the in the pre in the storyboard in their head the process of it yeah the process of it and what they already know and thinking about the next shot and all that that they actually forgot to just watch it and say yeah. is it working yeah it's that wood for the trees sort of it's uh, the wood for the trees absolutely yeah. that and so what my advice to to directors is to learn how to watch and listen and also probably you know as a as a as a kind of connection in connection to this same thing i used to arrive on set and think my job is to look like i know absolutely everything because <laughs> i don't want anybody to think that i'm i'm, I'm at sea here yeah you know it's scary, right? Yeah. Being in, in, in the director's chair a bit can be scary. And so I would go, I'd walk in and go, okay, what the scene's really about is this. We're going to do this. You're going to come in here. We're going to do it. And I really want to focus on this aspect and remember to do that, right? First of all, you're filling the actor's head, which is all with a lot of stuff. Yeah. Secondly, you are not letting them bring the thing that they might've just brought that you never will see now. 
because you've told everybody everything. Yeah. So my, my second piece of advice is don't be afraid to shut up. Right. Okay. And, and so what I often do is just say, like, let's, let's just run the scene. I, I don't know. Like, let's start really roughly block it. Like, I probably have something quite precise in my head, but I don't yeah. wanna, I want to. I'd rather we got there yeah. organically than that I just said it. So I got to go, like, I'm a bit sort of head scratchy and I'll say, okay, let's just, you know, let's take the camera away. Let's just run the scene. Don't worry. You just, just stay there and yeah. whatever happens, let's see. It's like looking and for those happy accidents. I it's like looking for the happy accident. And then you'll see and you go, ah. And then apart from anything, when you, as you start to shape it, you're bringing the cast with you. Yeah. Rather than coming in and going blah, 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 blah. So yeah. just what, learn how to watch, listen, and be quiet. And I think yeah. that's the best advice I ever got. Yeah. Do you think it's important then for, um, you know, for, for directors like yourself, for, for established directors to to sort of help nurture and bring through the next generation of talent um, in, you know, wherever, Ireland, Britain, the rest of the world. Absolutely. Totally. And I do, uh, we've, we've done mentoring, I've been part of mentoring schemes. So I am mentoring somebody at the moment. Um, and then we try and bring people into shadow, which mm. was hard with COVID, but yeah. hopefully now we can do it again. Yeah. Because I do, I think like, and there's nothing like just being on the floor watching somebody else work without the pressure of you being the one who has to make the decisions. Yeah. Cause if you think about directing, most directors only get to be in the environment uh, when they're actually in charge, which is kind of crazy. But imagine like a pilot, like the first time they get into the cockpit, they've actually got to fly the, you know, London yeah. Brussels yeah. shuttle. Yeah. <laughs> So I do think being around it and being and listening and watching and having somebody to talk to is really important. And I do think established directors should make time to do, you know, to sh have shadow, yeah. people shadow them and yeah. do mentoring, et cetera. Brilliant. Well, Lily, look, thank you so much. Your insight and opinions and uh, the things you've been talking about are so interesting. And I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today. And, uh, and thanks very much. Not at all. Pleasure, Danny. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.